Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're listening from. Just like to start this episode off by wishing you all a very happy new year. Um, for some of us, the new year starts in January. Uh, for others, maybe students, uh, it's the scholastic new year that starts in September, right around this time. Um, for Premier League fanatics, it's probably the beginning of the Premier League season uh, a few weeks back. But for us on this channel, the beginning of the new year is the first international window of the new footballing season. And so we're here. Happy New Year, all. Let's tie up our boots, spray, spray blessed water onto the nets, um, ward off the evil eye, put a few amulets into our socks, because year two of the African Five Aside podcast is here. Welcome to another episode, another year of the African Five Aside podcast, brought to you again by africasacountry.com. This year, we have new changes to the podcast. We have high-profile interviews just about on a nearly weekly basis, and we have rotating co-hosts so that you no longer just have to listen to my raspy voice. On this episode, we have Johnny McKinstry as a special guest, um, the new coach of the Gambian Scorpions, and we also have, as a co-host, Selim Mesut Said. Many of you will have known him from Twitter, where he's amassed an absolutely huge following. Uh, he's from Tanzania, but his knowledge of African football is second to none. So without further ado, Selim, welcome. How are you? Hello, Maher. I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? Doing good. I'm excited for the beginning of this new year. For me, it's the beginning of the African football new year. Uh, it's the first international window of the new season. Um, I wanted to know, what are your thoughts about this qualification process as we're building towards the 2025 African Cup of Nations? The AFCON takes place in December 2025. But really, the qualifying is going to take place over the next three months as we play two matches in September, two in October, two in November. What are your thoughts on the format? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I thank you for, so much for having me uh, on the show. I've been following the progress of this show for a while and it's very interesting what um, you're doing here, the discussion that's taking place. And it's something very new in the African football place. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion and contributing to this show and uh, thank you so much for all the work so far. Um, yes, yeah, so to answer your question, I, I think it's a very exciting time of the year. Um, not so much Christmas or Eid or any other festival, but in a different way for the football fanatics in Africa, um, I think. And uh, what I like about this window is the flurry of matches we get. Um, you know, I, I, we don't really overdo it in Africa, do we, in terms of the qualification period, because the calendar is quite squeezed. So in three months, we'll know who is at an AFCON, who's at the next Af AFCON in, uh, in Morocco. And that's just, for me, it's very good. I know some people want something that's a little bit of a slow burner, but I do like it that for any team that can get in the right form at this time, in these next three months, they will be an, at an AFCON. You know, that's quite special, for especially for those teams who don't really qualify often, or who've never qualified, it's a real opportunity that tells them that, look, if you get your act together now, if you can galvanize yourself and if you can get your tactics right and your organization right and your form right, most importantly, that you will be in Morocco next year. It, it really like, is all about yeah. timing, right? Because it's it's just those three months. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. On the other hand, of course, it's the team, there's teams as well also who, if you get it wrong, you, however big yeah. you are, whether you're mm -hmm. Nigeria or Algeria or uh, Egypt, you will not be at the next AFCON. So I do like the element of opportunity and then on the other hand, the element of danger that this format brings. And can I ask you about maybe one team that from the outside, I mean, they should be all systems go, uh, the Moroccan Atlas Lions. It's a country that you know fairly well. Um, they are going to be hosting the next edition of the AFCON. They haven't won the AFCON in 50 years. And I know that's eating up a lot of Moroccans inside. They want a trophy, despite all the incredible success they had at the World Cup, despite the success they've had at the club level. Winning that AFCON, I know, is a very big goal for a lot of Moroccans. Um, on paper, in my opinion, it's the best side in Africa. The under-23s, what they did at the Olympics, was very impressive as well, uh, securing a, a bronze medal. And it shows that it's not only this generation that are at their prime, it's also the next generation coming up. What are your thoughts about Morocco? Do you expect them to breeze through these, uh, even though they've qualified automatically, through these next three months? And, and what are your thoughts really long-term going into the AFCON 2025? 
Well, it's it's an interesting discussion right now, right? It is you know I think the discussion um, that's coming up more of it is is Regragi the man to take them to that next level? Um, what that next level is, I guess, would differ, but I think it it centers around the style of play they're currently playing. Um, I think Moroccans do like their team to play with the style, with the zaz, uh, with the rat attached to their football that they've not really been seeing um, in recent months or in the recent outings that the Moroccan national team has done. And I think the challenge for Regragi is at the World Cup, he was playing as an underdog. And I, I think Regragi does thrive, as we saw also with Widad at club level, he does thrive when he's sort of like the underdog and he has to be the top dog. Whereas with Morocco, it, it's almost like they're in the World Cup and they're playing against all these big teams and they have to play the underdog role. And then they're at a, in Africa, they're a big team and have to switch their style of play and be more dominant in the position and probably less pragmatic and take more risks. So it's, you know, I, I do feel even in the recent interviews, uh, Regragi has kind of been not his upbeat self. He doesn't feel like he's getting the level of love that he should get after the World Cup. And I do feel also that the, the public might be getting a bit wary and tired of him. Now, as we saw with Morocco, uh, before the World Cup, they were not hesitant to fire Hadi Hodzic or make changes just before, even with the risk that come come with that. Um, so I, I think the next three months are really important for Igragi and Morocco, uh, the national team. You know, is he the man to take them forward? Um, can he get the public behind him? That's the most important thing. And I think that's one of his great strength, strengths, as we saw at the World Cup. That's one of his really great strengths. Um, so that's one to really keep an eye on, I think, in the next two to three months. And on paper, what do you make of their squad? I mean, there was this, you know, thing where they, they could say Morocco never really found that striker that they could rely on, right? Uh, Yusuf Nassiri was sort of blows hot and cold, scores really important goals. But, I mean, the confidence level I would have if he's one-on-one -on -one with a goalkeeper, you know, with the 10 seconds, I would have very low confidence compared to other strikers. But Yusuf Al-Adbi had a great season at the end of the season last season. Um and uh, obviously, you have um, uh, Sufyan Rahimi, who had a great Olympics. Yeah. Uh, so what do you make? Oh, sorry, I said Yusuf al of you. <laughs> I meant, uh, sorry, Olympiakos. Ayub al-Kabi. Ayub al-Kabi. Ayub al -Kabi. <laughs> I can't believe I made that mistake. But um, yeah, you had informed strikers like Rahimi and al-Kabi. Uh, what do you make of the striking situation? Because that seems to me like the only real question mark on paper, right? Exactly. That's the real only real real question mark because the squad depth is there you know he has options all over the pitch really um and even this striking situation what's really frustrating i think for uh the fans is they feel the ingredients are there you know i mean during the time of albert Renard, you know he didn't have he wasn't so blessed with such good options but they feel the options are already there we've seen Sufian rahimi during the olympics you know how he really came up uh, leaps and bounds. So he's there. Ayub al Kabi in the Europa um, uh, Conference League. You know, we saw what he could do um, against the very top teams in the Premier League as well, not just you know any average teams. So the frustrating thing is, all everything is there. Can you cook that dish and make it a successful one in Morocco next year, Walid? That's the magic question. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to take the initiative here and talk about a team that I have my eye on, uh, the Mali Eagles. The Eagles, uh, random fact, by the way, that the most common mascot on the African continent. I think uh, I think there's five teams that have the Eagles as their mascot. Um, and they have just hired former Gambian coach Tom Saint-Feet, the 51-year-old the Belgian uh, manager who has a lot of experience across the continent. And Mali are in a weird place because if you had asked me, you know, about eight months ago at the beginning of the AFCON, as they got out of the group stages with Eric Sekouchel, and I'm thinking, man, they have, you know, a homegrown coach, has his badges, well-respected, great results in the group stages. And then even they started taking the game to Cote d'Ivoire leading in the, in the first half. 
you say, okay, this is this is what we've been expecting from Mali for such a long time is when they get on the big stage, when they get to the big occasion, we know they have the quality to do it. Can they finally deliver? And they just produced a mental collapse of all time. And you had <laughs> just that meme of Eric Sekouchel kneeling on the sideline. That's what actually, <laughs> the- as soon as you mentioned him, that's what I was laughing about. <laughs> And they're pouring water on his head. And I just thought, oh, no, this is going to define Mali in football for, for at least a few years now. <laughs> but anyways, so, I, I mean, I, one very interesting fact I saw about them uh, this summer, they're going to have 11 players eligible to play in the UEFA Champions League. And that's really indicative of the quality that they have. I think that could be probably top on the African continent. Uh, they just had a youngster, a really great uh, midfielder who I've had, had my eye on, Eric uh, Kon- Seku Kone. Signed with Manchester United, of course. So so they have, I mean, talent up the wazoo, especially in central midfield, but also pretty great winner, wingers. Nene Dorjelis is, is coming into his own. They also have that thing about the striker, but Ibrahim Akone is coming back from an injury. He's uh, he's back in training. So so we're, he's always been great with the national team. Tom St. Fee, I thought that I did a good job with the Gambia with limited resources of playing a low block and surprising teams, you know, on the counter attack. I think if he employs those tactics... He can find some success with Mali, but it just comes down to this mental obstacle. I mean, we talked about it with Morocco just for the AFCON. Uh, we talked about it with Senegal before they won the AFCON. They, I mean, from independence to 2021, they didn't win anything at any level. All of a sudden, they win the AFCON, and it spreads out to the other all the other age categories, uh, the Chan, the under-20s, the under-17s, the beach soccer, um, and so on and so forth. And I think Mali have something like this, some, some kind of mental block. With the youth level, they seem to do well. They obviously have the quality on the pitch. But then I think it's a psychological thing and it's probably the conditions as well because they got off to kind of a poor start in FIFA World Cup qualifiers. They only have five points. Uh, Ghana and Comoros are leading the group with nine points. Only four out of 10 matches have been played so they can catch up to those sides. But uh, they were complaining about travel conditions when, you know, uh, in the last international window. And it was the captain, Hamari Traore, that put a letter out on social media complaining about, you know, travel and playing conditions. And then almost 15 to 20 of his teammates would go and post the exact same letter following taking his lead. And he was eventually suspended by the Malian Federation. Now, I don't know with Tom St. Pete coming into the fold, if they're going to bring him back into the fold and sort of make peace because he's a very important member of their squad. But for me, it's, it's twofold. It's psychological, but it's also the conditions. They need to be put in the right, proper professional conditions to succeed. What are your thoughts on Mali very briefly, Salim? Well, I think the psychological one is one of the massive ones, right? As we, we, we've just spoken about Morocco, that a nation needs, for me, a nation needs regular success um, because if they don't get that, then it's a confidence thing, right? If, you, if you're Egypt or if you're Cameroon, you walk into an AFCON and you kind of, history mm. tells you you're going to do well, mm. right? Success and, begets success. Confidence begets confidence. It's a momentum yeah, thing. Exactly. So you need to build up that momentum. Um, and then as a nation, you start to have that confidence in you. And then it means when you get to an AFCON, you're like, okay, <laughs> minimum semi-final, even if we're not a good team. You know, we've had teams in the AFCON like um, Cameroon 2017, who you remember my hero. Yeah. You can probably <laughs> it is. Two names in that team, if you're, if you're even somebody who watched every single one of their games. But um, why did they win it? I believe they won it because they're Cameroon. They've won it a lot of times. And they came in going, you know, if, they're, if, if their coach is saying, we're going to go and win it or we're going to get to the final, they don't think, you're crazy, right? Whereas if you're a Mali and the coach is telling you, you're in, the, you're in Ivory Coast right now, you're in Morocco, we're going to get to the final and win it. You might even look at the coach and say, actually, you're a bit crazy. Let's just take it step by step. So it's a football heritage thing as per Jose Mourinho. Yeah, belief. Belief is so important in, in international football. Let's take a shift. Let's take a break from Salim and myself. And what I did was I had the opportunity to speak to Johnny McKinstry, the new coach of the Gambian Scorpions. Me and Salim, we've known about him for a while. He sort of entered African football about a decade ago, around the same time that we started speaking and, and talking about African football. A few months ago, there was a lot of uncertainty surrounding Gambian football. They didn't play any friendlies in the March window. Um, Tom St. Pete, who was there for five years, uh, leaves after a disappointing AFCON, I would say. 
He did so well with them in the first AFCON that they qualified for in 2000, uh, the 2021 AFCON, where they got to the quarterfinals in their debut tournament. Last year was a little more difficult. They pushed Cameroon in the final match, but they couldn't qualify out of the group stages. So Tom St. Pete leaves. Johnny McKinstry comes in. He has big shoes to fill, but I kind of like what he had to say. So take a listen for yourselves. Uh, Coach, thanks for joining me on the African Five Aside podcast. Um, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's nice to sort of meet you across the the uh, sort of inter internet. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, thanks for having me. It's it's good to have a chat. Pleasure is all mine. And usually, I whenever I interview a coach anywhere at any level, uh, my first question to them is always, "What's the best part of being?" the coach of the Gambia. Um, I know you've only been there for a matter of months, but so far, what would you say your provisional answer to that question is? I think it's just always the players. You know, that's not just the case of the Gambia, although we've got a great group of guys with the Gambia, but the players and staff and, you know, everyone working together to try and um, to try and do better, to try and move sort of the needle forward. And I've been very fortunate in my career to date that everywhere I've sort of landed, yes, we've had to add things to the environments, but we come into pretty good environments to begin with. And so, yeah, from my little experience so far with the Gambia, that it's a great group of guys, not just on the field, the support staff, all really hardworking, really positive people. And that's the type of environment that I think we can really thrive and grow something in. So, so I listened to your introductory press conference and you, spoke about this model forward together and that being a sort of uh, spirit, but also, you know, on the pitch very, you know, very concretely like going forward together. Um, is this um, a model that you've sort of developed specifically for the Gambian job or is this a more of a general philosophy that you sort of uh, have inculcated within you? Yeah, for me, it's sort of my core principles sort of run through all the teams I've been with. Um, you have a, an idea of how you want to play the game. You know, I was very fortunate. I grew up as a, a youngster in Ireland. I was the only youngster in black and white of Newcastle United. Everyone else was in Man United or Liverpool. But I grew up watching that great Kevin Keegan team of the early and mid 90s. And so that really that planted a seed of how football should be played. You want to go and entertain. You want to go and attack. Um, you want to use the ball well. And so you want to, you know, give supporters something to go home and talk about in a positive way. And so for me, it really is a playing mindset. But then it's about what tools do you have at your disposal to implement that. And so with the Gambia, it was twofold. Um, they've done really well over recent years. The previous coaches have done such a fantastic job and, you know, back-to-back -back AFCON appearances, the quarterfinals, that should not be underestimated how difficult it was for the previous guys to take them to that level. But it was done on a, let's say, a more low block, more conservative, counter-attacking type of play. Now, the Gambia is a culture, the FA, the, the government, the supporters... We're really hungry now to take that next step of, yes, we're winning, but now we want to win in, a, in an attacking, more free-flowing manner. And that's why they you know, reached out to me and said, look, we think you can play you, the way you like to play sort of mirrors this. And can you come? So there's a desire for us to go and play that attacking football. But also when you look at the players on the field, when you look at strikers like Ali So, Adama Sidibe, um, Adama Bojang, when you look at wingers like Yankuba Mente, Ali Federa, Brian McCauley, like some Musa Baro, Ablai Jallo, you know, all these great attacking talents you know, for me, it makes it's such an obvious thing to say, hey, let's give them the ball as often as possible and as close to the opposition goal as possible. Right. And it gives us a really good chance to win some football matches. So for me, it was both methodol methodological in terms of it's just how I like to play the game. But also there was a big desire from the Gambia as a nation to go that direction. And look, for me, if you want to make any change, you've got to have everyone on board. So when I say about we're moving forward, but it's all well and good me wanting to do that. But if the players don't want to do it, if the federation don't want to do it, we're always going to hit a roadblock. And so that's why I'm saying we've got to do it together and also reminding people that, look, as you make these changes, there are going to be potholes in the road. There's going to be little moments where something goes wrong, but you have to stay true to the course and you've got to stick together in those moments. 
And at the other end of it, hopefully there's something really special where not only can we continue to win, but we can win in this really exciting, this really enjoyable way. Such an underrated aspect of international football. I've been covering African football for about a decade now, uh, approximately the same time you started on the continent as well. And all the great teams, all the teams that win AFCON, you see a togetherness, you see a belief in the, and it's like you say, it permeates everybody, not just the players, the coaching staff and so on and so forth. Um, can we talk about the first two matches that you were in charge of? Uh, the Seychelles 5-1, attacking football, great, great goals. Uh, even Gabon, that first goal you guys scored against Gabon, lovely free-flowing football. I, I really love that as well. Um, what were some of the positives that you took from those two matches? If you could just bullet points, if possible, and, and some of the negatives as well. I think of the four goals you conceded over those two matches, one of them we couldn't see because it came just after halftime and there was a power cut. Me personally, I couldn't find the, the Jim Alavina goal, but I know at least two were from set pieces. So we're, what are maybe some of the, the positives and negatives that you took away from those two matches? Yeah, I think the big negative is we've got to tidy up defensively at set pieces. There's no doubt about that. You know, if you look at my record as a coach, um, we've usually been very strong, both defensive and offensively from set pieces. So for me, that's a big thing that will get better. I've got no doubt about that. We always improve it at every team. We were missing 11 players in the last camp that had went to AFCON. So there was a lot of new guys. So that plays into that understanding and connection when defending set pieces so I, I expect that to get better but that's a big big thing for us another thing is just being really clinical i think the guys when they've pulled on that red shirt of the gambia have been used to not as many chances you know we created a lot of chances like against gabon in the second game we could have been three nil up at half time um, and the game would have been put to bed. And even in the bit that you missed, um, because obviously the long delay at half time and then the TV not coming back on, actually we had three golden chances at the beginning of the second half, all back to back, and we don't quite convert them. And then Gabon catches on the counter attack and score a beautiful goal. Mm. Um, but if we convert and make it 2-0 at that point, again, it puts the game a little bit out of reach for them. So the guys have to understand that, hey, we're going to get chances with the way we play. And so we're creating the chances. That's positive. We need to more be more clinical. That's, that's the improvement point. And the other thing as well is just be confident in your own ability, whether that's offensively or defensively. Like we always talk in football about making sure we've got plus one, make sure we've got defensive overloads or attacking overloads. But what we're saying, a little bit like maybe Tottenham under Ange Postacoglu, is that if we want to attack in this style, there's going to be moments that we're 1v1, 2v2 at the back. But let's not complain about that situation mm. because it's the trade-off that you have to make. And can we be good enough in those 1v1, 2v2 defensive moments that we get the ball back, we, we break the attack, and then we go again. So I think that's it. I think set piece is a big thing. Being clinical from the chances we know we're now going to create because of this new sort of approach to the game. And then just having that confidence that, hey, I'm not waiting for another one or two teammates to come and help me out. I'm going to deal with this situation and be good enough to deal with it here and now. Very well. And... You also spoke in your press conference about a lot of your players being young. I think you're at the average age of your squad, I believe you said was 24 years old, um, which is very, very young. And obviously it's important to have players like like Omar Kohli there to, to sort of anchor the defense. And he's the most capped player in Gambian football history and, and is a rock at the back. But um, what excites you so much about having, you know, 20 year olds, 19 year olds, 21 year olds, 23 year olds? Um, do you believe that coaching them is like some of the most enjoyable parts of your job is, is coaching young players and to sort of do what you want them to do on the pitch. I think it's an interesting thing because, you know, you can have, there's some older players who you would think are 19 or 20, but actually when you look they're they're actually <laughs> almost 30. Um, so young at heart is probably what we're looking for. Right. And that, I will say enthusiasm is the biggest thing. You know, you've got to turn up. doesn't matter whether you're a footballer or you work in IT or law or medicine. You've got to turn up enthusiastic every day to work. And if you're enthusiastic, you've got an opportunity to make progress. If you're not enthusiastic, it's always a labor. It's, it's difficult. And so naturally, enthusiasm probably comes a lot more easily to the young. 
you know, when you're 19, 20, you haven't learnt so many lessons yet, so you're a bit more free with yourself, and that enthusiasm natural. And even the great Sir Alex Ferguson once said, you know, having young players in the squad brings that energy just because of who they are and the age they are. And so I think having that on the field is really important. But equally, like you said, it's about getting that blend and actually the challenge and what's it's a difficult challenge, but it's a really enjoyable one with the Gambia is we've got all these super talented young players. Obviously, the Gambia got to the quarterfinals of the U20 World Cup and, you know, really good. But our older players, most of them are still in their 20s. You know, so right. if I want to give a, a, a run out to someone like uh, Mamadou Bajo, who we gave his debut to, or Adama Bojang, who we gave his debut to in the last camp, both 19, 20 years of age, I'm not phasing out a 34-year-old. Actually, the guy whose shirt he has to take is only 27, 28 himself at his prime. And so that makes it really difficult for the young guys to break through because there's not a natural sort of falling off, if you will, for the older guys. They've still got miles in the tank. So that's a difficult thing we're going to have to deal with over the next couple of years, but it's a really enjoyable challenge. And, and it, look, when you've got that young sort of upstart, enthusiastic sort of teenager pushing through, I think it helps keep the older players in the squad yeah. young because it starts that fire underneath them that they've got to keep performing. Otherwise, someone's ready to jump in ahead of them. Absolutely. And before we wrap up our conversation uh, by looking ahead to the, the two upcoming matches, um, at the beginning of the AFCON qualifiers for, for the 2025 AFCON in Morocco. I just wanted to ask you very quickly about Yankuba Minte. I have to because so many people in the Premier League are talking about him. Uh, a 33 million pound signing. Uh, we're not used to seeing that from the Gambia. He's 20 years old. He had a great season last year at Feyenoord and a really good preseason and a beginning of this season with Brighton, Hove and Albion. Um, you've obviously been his coach for just two matches. Um, what have you seen from him as a person, as a player, and what do you think his ceiling can be um, going into the future? Well, the first thing is he's very humble. You know, he, he's, yes, he's had a lot of, he's had a huge meteoric rise. You got to remember, this is a kid that three years ago was playing in the Gambian League, and the Gambian League is still amateur. So only three years ago, before he went to Odense in Denmark and then Newcastle, he was still playing on pretty rough pitches here in the Gambia. So his rise has been meteoric, but he's dealing with that so well. You know, he's such a humble, hardworking kid. He's quite quiet, at least around the coaches. Maybe he's a bit louder when it's just the players, but he's quite a quiet kid. But he has that thing that winners have, which is that real determination. He doesn't like anyone messing around he wants he takes training seriously when he's out there when you've got a point to make to him he listens he tries to put it into practice he wants to be successful and if he were to see anybody falling below those standards even though he's still only 20 years of age he's he'll go and have a word with that player so you know he has that real drive and focus but at the same time he's super humble he's not He's not flash in any way. You know, he knows that if he doesn't work hard, then all that he's achieved could very easily disappear. So, yeah, he, he's got a nice balance to him. And in terms of a ceiling, look, I think Brighton's a really good move for him. They're a club who who um, put trust in young players. Um, I think in the game against Manchester United this most recent weekend, 65% of their attacks went down Young Cuba's side of the field. So they're clearly playing to him. He's a big part of their attack. And so at 20 years old, to have that responsibility and that trust of your coach and your teammates it is so important. And look, if he has a good season with um, with Brighton, hopefully he gets them back into Europe, challenging for maybe a cup, then look, who knows what the next few years can bring. But he's still super young. And like we're talking about Omar Cawley being, you know, the record cap holder for the Gambia. You know, Jan Kuba already has, what, six or seven caps and three goals. Yeah. And he still has maybe another 10 or 13 years of playing in the national team. So he's a guy that could potentially go on to break that record that Omar currently has. I believe with three goals, um, he's already in the top eight of, of goal, goal scorers ever for the Gambian national team. So yeah, the, the future quite seemingly, it seems to be quite bright for him going ahead. So, the, so let's the one talk thing about... I would say, if I can just jump in on that, Please. the one thing I would say is 
Adama, I think, is the tip, or not Adama, sorry, um, Yankuba, I think, is the tipping point, because you might not believe me, but I think there's better to come in terms of other players. Like, Yankuba is a top young player, but there's other guys in the next two or three years, I would expect, you know, you will also see in the top divisions, top five leagues around Europe. So, yeah, he's one of what we hope will be many in the coming years. It's extremely, extremely exciting. Um, so let's talk about the two upcoming matches, difficult matches, and you guys are in a difficult group of the AFCON with uh, Madagascar, Comoros, and Tunisia. Tunisia, we call the Germans of Africa. They haven't missed an AFCON quali They haven't missed qualifying to an AFCON since 1994. Uh, so very, very difficult team to sort of eliminate. But two teams do qualify from the group. The other nations are, are island nations, and I remember the previous uh, Af uh, CAF president Ahmed Ahmad saying. Um, you know, us on the islands, we're very resolute. We can uh, we can deal with the storms. We can deal with the intemperate weather. Um, it's in our DNA. It's in our blood to be resolute. And they've started very well in the FIFA World Cup qualifiers. Comoros have nine points. They're leading their group. Tunisia have 10 points. They're leading their group. How are you preparing for these two matches? If we could start just with the Comoros, which is a Wednesday match, which means you have to very quickly get into gear, get into rhythm. How, what do you think are there perhaps some of the things you have to do to get a good result against Comoros? I think the key is our players being as fresh and energetic as possible. Comoros are a very energetic, very athletic team. You know, they work together extremely well. You know, over the last two years, their record in all games has been fantastic. They beat Uganda 4-0 in a friendly towards the back end of last year. Obviously, beat Ghana 1-0 as well as their other results. So Comoros, we expect a really difficult game. We, we think they'll do what they do. You know, they play the way they play. They're not going to change it for us. So for us, it's about Wednesday game. Um, I think 70% of our squad play on Friday or Saturday. 30% play on Sunday. So... You know, it's about picking a team who can go out and play, you know, at their at their highest for 95 minutes. Now, the nice thing is of our sort of 30 man long list, 29 of them are starting for their clubs. So what we know is the guys who take the field will be match fit and ready to go. That hasn't always been the case in the past for the Gambia. You've maybe been picking players who've been on the bench up in Europe or wherever. So guys who are ready who, you know, know their jobs. And again, it's about, look, Comoros, we've got to give them big respect because they've done so well and they are dangerous in their own way. But for us, again, can we give our match winners the ball as often as possible? And if we do that, we know we will cause them a lot of problems. And then I've already touched on it. It's about being clinical. Um, and, and that really is it. That's a big game. We've got to, we've got to try and take three points from that. Uh, before we even start to consider, or at least the players start to consider what comes against Tunisia. Okay. And, and Tunisia, I mean, they're notorious on the continent for defending very well, even if they don't score so many goals. Um, do you have a plan of attack there? Because you did speak about, you know, previous iterations of this Gambian national team perhaps being a little, you know, I don't, know if, I don't know if you want to say defensive, but they were playing a little bit of a lower block and, and so on and so forth. And you did say that, that is in this team's locker as well. Do you anticipate perhaps being a little more cautious against a side like Tunisia? Uh, are you still targeting three points? Are you targeting one point? Or are you looking to attack them all out? Now, for us, our mentality is to go and attack for as often as we can, for as long as we can. Um, but also understanding that all 11 players have a responsibility to defend. But defending... I always think people, when they say the word defending, think of a negative approach, think of dropping back down the pitch. But defending can equally be pressing, you know, all 10 of your outfield players in the opposition half, trying to win the ball back. That's also defending. Um, and so for us, it's about positive defending. It's about going and putting people under pressure. And look, the Gambia historically have a good record against North African nations. Yeah, so not <laughs> that, there's not that mental block that a lot of teams have. A lot of teams play against, whether it's Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, Algeria, a lot of teams play against these and they go in already a bit worried, a bit concerned. Whereas the Gambia's historic record against the North African nations has been positive, one of the better ones on the continent. And so for us, there's no fear about the game. There's respect because, like you said, Tunisia have a phenomenal record. But equally, 
last time out. I think they drew away to Namibia. So it's it's a team that can draw points. So we respect them. But I also think they'll look at our team sheet and they'll have to respect us because they'll see some of the names on that team sheet and know that this is not the Gambia of 15, 20 years ago. This is the modern Gambia who who can win football matches when they play. And we'll tie it up with this final, final question, um, if it's okay with you. Um, I, me personally, I looked at this group and I said, I think this is going to go, you know, to the final match day um, in terms of, of qualifying. It's going to be very, very tough. There's going to be ups and downs. How important is it for you as a coach to host matches in the Gambia, even if it's not for these first two rounds, perhaps later on in the group stages? I know the, the group stages, I mean, it's not taking qualification. is not over two years or three years. Is it possible to perhaps host matches later on in the group? Yeah, we're really hopeful. Um, we're hopeful for October. And even when I first came in and took the job, those honest conversations that we had were that it might be possible for September, but realistically, October was the more realistic target. And I think we're largely on for that. You know, I see the updates. I'll be flying down to Banjul tomorrow morning and I'll get to visit the stadium again. I always go every time I'm there to see firsthand where we are, you know, meet with different people from government just to have that sort of say and little things that can help us along the way. And the stadium is almost there. Um, and we're very hopeful that for October, we'll be able to host Madagascar there. But look, there's no doubt, it's been, I think someone told me, it's been almost five years now since the Gambia oh. last hosted a home game. Oh. And so given in those five years, there's been two African Cup of Nations appearances. There's been a complete sort of regeneration of the side with guys now playing in Ligue 1, Serie A, the Premier League. You know, I think it's going to be a capacity crowd. It's a little bit sad that that can't be against Tunisia in a couple of weeks' time because what a game that would have been. The first game, maybe even under the floodlights, capacity crowd against a giant of African football. But, you know, Madagascar in match day four could well be a decisive game depending on how the first three rounds of games go. So it's important to play at home. On the African continent, home advantage counts for so much. And so, yeah, we're just... Fingers crossed, but we're we're confident that October we'll be able to play at home again. Yeah, I'm sure the Gambian public is thirsting for a chance to see everybody in person again after so long. Coach, thanks again for your time. Uh, it was really, really insightful, and best of luck to you for the upcoming matches. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. So, Salim, what did you make of Johnny McKinstry and what he had to say uh, about his upcoming stint with the Gambian Scorpions? Well, it's a great situation to walk into. I think even he seems to appreciate that he's not inherited a mess. You know, I think most coaches or a lot of coaches kind of walk into a situation sometimes and everything need, is a mess or they need to sort a lot out. Um, whereas I, I do feel from what Johnny said, probably his priority is changing or, or you know, changing the style of play to something that's more attacking perhaps um, and easier on the eye. Uh, that's what uh, that the fans want, he says, and well, that's what the Federation wants. Um, so it's a great situation to inherit, and that's a great testament to the work that Tom St. Fitz did uh, during his time there. Um, he's got a great, also, um, pool of talent there. So it's, it's an up-and-coming nation. We discussed Yacouba Mente um, and the other young players amongst that. So he's got something great to work in because sometimes you can walk into a situation and you don't really have yeah. the, the talent pipeline uh, to be able to do something with it. Uh, but I thought it was really interesting how he said uh, that youth is really important in what he's trying to do. So the team has an average age of 24, 25, I believe. Yeah. Um, so it, it's quite interesting that, you know, earlier early this week I was reading um, an article about Sir Alex Ferguson and, you know, how he was obsessed with youth. And one of the quotations, uh, one of the things he said was, for an organization to be successful, it needs to be built on youth, right? And I think that's what Johnny is essentially saying, that youth doesn't really mean that at 31 or you're old, you just need to have that youthful energy. And for somebody, you know, some of the more experienced older players, perhaps, they need to feed off that youth 
because again, you know, we we all, as, as like Alice Ferguson said, if you have that zest of youth in you, then it's much easier to do things and much easier to evolve and much easier to um, continue to develop as a team. So yes. it's really interesting that Johnny McKissie was talking about things in a similar vein. So he's not quite Sir Alex Ferguson, but it's quite clear that he's a student of the game. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Uh, he I've touched upon those almost exact things. So thank you for the insight. Um, one final thing before I let you go, Salim. Can we talk about the Tanzanian, the Taifa stars uh, ahead of, I mean, they have three months ahead of them. So the last time I remember them was at the AFCON. It was a mess. Uh, the Algerian coach, Adela Marouche, went and threw out some accusations. He was suspended. Uh, Hamed Morocco, ironically named, came in and took over uh, the side. And where are we now? What's the state of the Tanzanian national team? And is it absolutely imperative that they qualify for Morocco 2025? Or are they more in the mindset of building a side going into the 2027 AFCON, where they're, of course, going to be one of three hosts? Uh, yes, great question. I think at this stage of our game, especially our local game now, where you see you know, young Africans getting to the final, Simba doing well in the Champions League, regularly getting to the quarterfinals um, and being in the African Football League um, as well. What you do have is, I, I think people have high expectations. Um, now, some people say those high expectations don't quite match when you get to the national team, but I think because of the success, relative success, at the of our local clubs, what you do get is people now expect the team to regularly reach tournaments. So it's never a matter of, oh, we're building for three years. No, they want to qualify for the next one because we've qualified for the previous one. And I think for Tanzania, you know, the target for me is regularly, first of all, getting into these competitions. So having that track record of saying, we belong in the Afghan regularly, you know, kind of five, six, seven years, maybe qualify in five, six of them. That will be the next step for us. Um, of course, there's been some changes, major changes. So Samata has not been selected for this um, window and neither has um, uh, Simon Msuva as well. Obviously, those are two of our best players in the last five to 10 years, our goal scorers, the players who are have that exposure of playing abroad and doing a very good job as well of um, raising that Tanzanian flag. So uh, those are big misses. Obviously, some matter is because he doesn't have a team or didn't have a team at the time of um, the, the selection. And Msuva is the same. He's just recently uh, found a team. So again, Heaven Morocco has said the door is always open for them. It's just the timing is not quite right. And then Aishi Manula, who is our top goalkeeper, and has been our number one for a long time as well. He's kind of in a dispute with, with Simba at the moment as well. So he's not really been playing uh, regularly and he's not been selected. So again, those are, you know, those three are, I would say, are three of our core players. So it's anyone's guess in terms of what we'll accept, we will, um, we will uh, expect in these coming week, weeks and months. Um, but I mean, I'm looking forward to it just to see how we perform without those players, especially Samata and Musuba. You know, how will our attack actually look? Um, do we have enough? I, I think we have Clement Mzizi, of course, he's a very promising uh, striker at the moment. He's called the Tanzanian Drogba. Um, <laughs> and he has actually a star reminiscent to him. So I'm really looking forward to him because it's a big opportunity for him to step up and say, this is now my number nine jersey. And in 60 seconds or less, how are the preparations for the AFCON 2027 going? It's the first time the AFCON is going back to East Africa in decades. Yeah, they're, they're going well in Tanzania, at least. They're going well. Um, I think Tanzania probably are more strategic in how we're doing it. Um, my Kenyan friends and Ugandans might say I'm, I'm being biased here or I'm trying to wind them up. Um, but I do think Tanzania is more strategic. We have the new Amani complex in Zanzibar, uh, which is ready already. Uh, we have the KMC complex, which might not be part of the bid, I don't think, but it's already ready. There are other stadiums being built as well and being renovated. For them, Kappa Stadium is ready. Azam complex is ready. So I think we're readier than the other nations. We have those two Kappa approved stadiums, Kappa, um, and then Azam Stadium, Azam complex. So 
I, I think we have we, we, we are more strategic in how we're doing it and we're not far off. Um, and it is something that is also being discussed constantly in Tanzania. So I, I do like that we are discussing it and things yeah. are happening because it's a big thing for our country. Yeah, the excitement is palpable. I, I personally can't wait for that AFCON. Uh, I need to brush up on my Swahili before I get out there, but um, really, really looking no, well, forward I'll, to it. I'll teach you a couple of words. <laughs> <laughs> the important ones. <laughs> uh, before we go, I just wanted to just talk two minutes about Algeria, my team, uh, or at least where I'm from. And I, me personally, I couldn't be more pessimistic about the Algerian national team in, in a very, very long time. Um, this sort of disintegration began when Jamal Belmadi, after you know that 35 match winning streak, which followed the Afcon triumph in 2019, disintegrated, didn't fail to qualify for the World Cup in 2022, and then failed to get out of the group stages. For the next two Afcon uh, African Cup of Nations, and since then, um, the the country it feels like there's there's too much politics in the football. Everybody has agendas. There are groups of supporters that are supporting Jamal Belmadi still, despite the fact that he's been fired. Others that are supporting the new federation president, who's by the way I think number six or number seven in the last eight or nine years. And there's just way too much interest and drama. And it, throughout this whole thing, I don't feel like there's a, a team that's being built really. Um, there's very little confidence that Vladimir Petkovic, the new coach, the Swiss Bosnian coach, is actually selecting his own players. Um, many believe it's the federation that's assigning them. Um, the, the, the team is scoring goals under Petkovic, but they're also conceding a worrying amount of goals. And I don't see solutions for the problems that have plagued Algerian football over the last three, four years, meaning the central defense, defensive midfield, uh, defending set pieces. All of these things are problems that have persisted and we haven't really found a solution yet. So... Uh, me personally, I think Algeria still has enough quality to get to the next AFCON in Morocco, which will be huge, by the way, for for Algeria, um, two yeah. rival countries. And and there's going to be a lot of supporters that do end up over there. So they will be sort of feel like they'll be playing at home. Um, and I think that will be important to them. But they need to get there. And then once they once November passes, they really need to work on constructing a team. And the good thing for Algeria is they'll at least have 12 to 13 months to do that because the AFCON is so far away. Um, question, do you think too much has changed or is it that change or the the changes in the team haven't been managed well because I can still see players like um, you know uh, Riyad Mahrez uh, yeah. and obviously Mahrez Aysa is Mondi. Yeah, Aysa Mondi. Aysa Mondi is 30, 33 years yeah. old in central defence Mondi, um, Mondi is kind of like a constant he doesn't mm. really and I do like international football for those players who always turn up but, um, but yeah I was looking at the squad and I said is this that change that hasn't been managed well, or is it just like this is the best that Algeria has at the moment? Yeah, what I would say is that everything changed too quickly, but that's because nothing changed for so long prior to that. I think Belmadi stuck with that 23 that won in the AFCON for far too long. And then once it completely disintegrated, they tried to change everything too quickly. And as a result, you have no semblance of an actual core of a team. Um, and it's it's just like you say, like, players that have never really proved anything with the Algerian national team or imposed themselves sprinkled in with two or three veterans. And uh, I think even the players themselves, from what I'm hearing, even the players themselves are kind of have very low confidence and are not really sure what the project is in the long term. Anyways, we'll leave it there because we only have a few more minutes before Zoom kicks us off. I really hope you enjoyed the first episode back. If you made it this far, please remember to share. Please remember to comment. Please remember to give us a thumbs up on YouTube. We really want more five stars on podcast platforms. So help us out and rate us there if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anywhere else. And enjoy the matches. Uh, we'll be back in a week or so to discuss the results, perhaps with Salim or perhaps with another guest host. We'll figure that out uh, in the coming days. Anyways, enjoy the international football. Enjoy African football. And we'll speak soon. Peace.